Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you all again. And uh, some of you uh, are regular visitors to us here, and we really enjoy seeing you each time you come. And some of you are new to us, and, the, and that's exciting, too. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to work with you today and uh, to deal with this big, 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 big issue that sometimes we need to think a bit smaller uh, of curriculum and curriculum development. Uh, I'm Dr. Ray Lindley. I'm the Executive Director for Array Global Accreditation. And uh, with me today is Dr. Mike Poe. You'll see Mike, uh, if your screen is the same as mine, uh, you'll see Mike uh, uh, right in the middle of that top row. And uh, Mike is our Associate Director. Uh, Dr. Mike and I will be traveling to Myanmar in late February. We just uh, secured our tickets yesterday. It's a little complicated to get there from here, but we finally made it. And we'll be doing uh, a wonderful school in Myanmar in the February. And of course, this is Dr. Jake Frank. I'm the Associate Executive Director who really is uh, uh, one of the key reasons why we're here and why we keep, uh, keep extending ourselves and uh, offering these workshops. So welcome Dr. Jake and Dr. Mike. And I'm seeing if there's any, there's several other people here. And if I start listing names, I'll be in trouble because I'll probably miss some. We only show one page at a time. And, uh, and so I, I'm sure if I start listing names of welcoming people, but I hope all of you uh, saw the bell ringer that Dr. Jake put on the screen. Uh, uh, early on, and uh, he calls that a bell ringer. And I'm going to ask Dr. Jake to go ahead and talk about bell ringers and why they're an important part of the curriculum process. Dr. Ray, is it okay if I talk a little bit about um, some of our upcoming activities? Sure. Why not? Since you're going to do it anyway, why don't uh, you do it? Well, I don't have to. I mean, we can. No, hold you're, you're fine. Go ahead. End. So I wanted to make sure everyone is aware of our academic competitions right now. We have our art and photography contest going on. It goes until February 1st, and it is free. You do not need to be in Array Global School to have your students participate. The art medium is two-dimensional art. Just click right here, and it'll take you and tell you um, all the different details to enter your students, your students' work. So we're really, really excited about that. We always have hundreds of students that participate in these contests. We do a writing contest in the fall and our spring um, fair is a science fair contest. So we're excited about that. As we usually talk about, if your school is interested in being accredited by Array Global, please let us know. We have some great partnerships that really strengthen our organization. Uh, we're partners with Middle States Association here in the United States and also NCPSA, the National Council for Private School Accreditation. Please look at that and, and see how we can best support you and help you in your improvement process. And then I would also encourage you to look at our other services that we have. We provide a certification service if you're interested in uh, getting your school uh, approved to do STEAM and STEM and have that specific recognition. We also ho have a host of consulting services with a lot of consultants that have a, a variety of experience that can really help you out in whatever area you're in. One thing uh, just actually happened recently this past week. We have started an Array Global uh, Professional Educators Association Facebook page. So I would encourage everyone to get onto that page. Um, it's a group so you can add your own questions and all three of us our administrators and can go in and answer questions, or you can go in and answer some of the questions of other professionals in the area, or you can talk about some things, that, uh, great things that are going on in your school um, or some struggles that you want to share and get some feedback from others. Also, in January 1st, we have our uh, administrator and teacher of the year awards that are opening up. You can go there and learn more about that. With that award, you do have to be an Array Global school to be part of that. So join Array Global and you can be part of these great awards and recognitions. Um, and then lastly, I just want to go over our sister school program. This uh, sister school program puts you in contact with the school here in the United States that you can exchange ideas and even come over and visit the school in the United States if you're interested. So check that out and uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do to help and now I will get into this bell ringer. So. Uh, before you do, Dr. Yeah, Jake, there's there are still a few people who are saying they don't have sound. 
Uh, yeah, I, that's, some, that's something on their own computer that they have to figure out. They might want to restart their computer um, mm -hmm. uh, or there, there's got to be something wrong with their volume. So we've, we've done all the tests that we need to and uh, we're hearing each other loud and clear. So if you're on a phone, just make sure you, you might want to reset. If you're on a computer, you'll want to check your, your sound settings. So good luck with that. Uh, uh, that's just how technology goes when you're teaching, I think. So I wanted to talk about what a bell ringer is, and, and people call it different things. Right now, the, the big buzz term is to call it a bell ringer. It starts at the, at the very beginning of class. Often teachers will uh, put up the bell ringer even before class starts because there's always some management things that teachers need to do at the very beginning of the day. And so instead of having students sit there and, and talk to each other and, and waste or fritter away their time, a bell ringer, they come right in, the students come right in, and they're immediately engaged. They know exactly what uh, question or product or, or assignment they have to do, and, the, and they're maximizing their time. Um, often when we talk to teachers, Dr. Ray and I, we talk about the importance of time. Time is, is, is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that we all have as educators. And if we maximize our time, we're gonna maximize learning. If you imagine of uh, spending one minute just doing management stuff, taking attendance and, and doing other things, that one minute over the course of a year can be can add up to several hours. And if you do multiple minutes and you have multiple downtime over the course of the year, you're wasting multiple days of learning, which can add up over 12 years of a student's um, education could add up to a significant portion of what they need to be learning. So we wanted to get you to think about what is a good curriculum. And uh, I really like the comments in there. What do you see in there, Dr. Ray and Dr. Mike? Well, I'm seeing some, some excellent comments on the definition of curriculum, and I think it's going to lead us in the direction we need to go today. I wanted to add one thing to your bell ringer suggestion, and that is uh, some of you have uh, attended workshops that I've done, um, and you know that I'm very much uh, uh, aligned with uh, ITIP, Instructional Theory into Practice, and Madeline Hunter calls this a set. SET. And if you practice this with your students and they get used to this, if they come in and they either see a bell ringer or a set to say, this is the emphasis for today, it doesn't take them very long to realize that, hey, this is what we're going to do today. Like Dr. Jake said earlier, how many of you have really answered the question that we put up there as a bell ringer? What is a good curriculum? And whether, no matter what it is you say, it gets you in to the subject for the day. That's why this is so important, especially when we're talking about curriculum. And Dr. Ray, there's one good comment, Dr. Emu, um, I think that's how you say your name, uh, it states, it is a standard sequence of planned experience where students practice and achieve learning skills. I think emphasizing that last part where they achieve learning. That that's that's you know that's what's key in, in what we're going to be talking about today. And also, I wanted to point out, I liked what Dr. Mike calls uh, bell ringers. He calls it the daily science. He and I both taught science, and I mean that you can call it whatever you want. But the point is, is to maximize that time. I really like that though, uh, Dr. Mike. It, and it worked really well because it was either over material, the question about material from the day before to so I some review or even a question about what we're gonna be talking about that day so that I would find out what they already knew. And then we went over the question in class and talked about it. And there was usually some, there was always a little couple of points that went along with getting it filled out and so on. But uh, it, it, like you said, it, it made me, it was, I was able to take care of my management activities during that time as opposed to having to take instructional time. Yeah, that's great. So we're, we're going to try to do today what we're suggesting you do. And that is to, number one, start off with something the students are to be. But number two, we're, we want to share with you what we want to do today. And hopefully by the end of this uh, workshop today, you will see these are the four points that we really uh, are going to emphasize today. Dr. Jake, you want to get this started? Yeah, absolutely. So our objectives of today are to, we're going to, we're going to help you understand the process of developing curriculum. We want you to know the definition of scope and sequence. We want you to understand how integration is vital to curriculum. So we're going to be talking a lot about uh, integration. 
And then number four, we want you to understand how the Common Core fits into a learning platform. So we'll be talking a little bit about Common Core. We understand that some of you teach the British program um, and, and other types of programs out there. So we're just going to touch on that a little bit, but it, and we're going to be talking about how standards in general fit into that learning platform. I do want to point out is when you start off by a bell ringer, you're maximizing your time when you're starting out with an objective and making sure that students understand and the teacher understands your objective. Student performance increases. Harry Wong, a famous educator, he has stated that student performance increases by 27%. 27% when you, when you identify the objectives, students know what the objectives are, and the teacher understands those objectives. So very, very important to go over the objectives uh, in each one of your lessons. And I want to hit on number two especially. Um, I, I just let me tell you how important I believe this is. If you don't listen to anything else today, listen to the importance of scope and sequence. And we're going to be talking about this in a little bit. Most schools that are very successful truly understand this concept of scope and sequence. Scope is what you expect students to know, be, show, do by the time they leave your school, 12th grade, or if you're K through six school by the end of sixth grade or whatever. And the sequence is then what happens at each grade level so that all teachers are aware of what happens before their uh, students come to their class and after their students leave their class for the next grade. So please, please hold on to this special uh, one. Uh, know the definition of scope and sequence. And we'll talk that in a little bit. Uh, the next uh, thing that I, I like to put up here, it's, it's, it's just kind of to, uh, to help you understand the, the, the important roles that uh, teachers have. And uh, all of us have been teachers for a long time, all three of us. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to be a comedian to some degree, and uh, you you have to be a circus performer. Some of the greatest greatest teaching I've seen is when the teacher is so lively and uh, doing something that's really fun and, and appears to be having a good time. A Twenty percent educator, and unfortunately for most of us, we have to be ten percent parent because sometimes students come to school with some special needs uh, that are maybe not be. Uh, described or whatever, but I, I like this slide just because it kind of talks about the breakdown of the role of teachers. One of the things that I always say is that most educators are merely frustrated actors, yeah. and, the, and their stage is their classroom. Yep. Good one. But that's what kind of makes it fun, too, as a teacher, because you have so many of these different types of challenges, and so, um, yeah, and we can make such a difference in each one of our students' lives because of this, these different roles that we play. So we need to make very clear the difference of the definition between curriculum and instruction. You, it's not the same. Curriculum is the what, that's what you teach. Instruction is how you teach. Please understand the difference between those because we can, we're not gonna be talking much about teaching strategies today, the how, but we are going to be talking about curriculum, the development of the what. And that seems like a, a pretty solid part of what uh, the, uh, a foundation of, of education. If you don't have that what, you're not going to be able to do the how, don't you think, Dr. Ray? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's so you can, you'll be a total circus performer if you only work on the how, uh, because you've got to have something as a basis, which leads us to the next thing we need to define. And it really pains me greatly when I go into a school and we ask them what their curriculum is and they say, well, we use, and then they will name a textbook publisher. Uh, no, that's not a curriculum. That is a resource to teach your curriculum, a, a resource that you use to develop or to help teach the curriculum you've already decided. So please understand this. Don't just say, well, we use so-and-so publisher because that is material to help you teach. And if it's good material, it will help you greatly, but it's not the, the true curriculum, which we're gonna show you how we believe you can uh, develop curriculum so that you'll have other instructional materials that will be part of that. And hopefully the instructional materials you use will not just be 
one textbook as a resource, but you're going to bring in other things. You know, who would have thought uh, three, four years ago that we'd have to bring in uh, uh, materials on COVID or materials on uh, how, to, how to deal with uh, uh, online education? So that all became part of the resources to teach the curriculum. The curriculum should not have changed, but the how did. And I think you make a good point, Dr. Ray, about the instructional material of technology right now, because a lot of teachers will just do a Google search, pull off a worksheet, and then throw it throw it down for their students to do. And we have to be very targeted in what kind of materials we are using to engage students in that learning process, because there, there's a lot of stuff out there, and uh, we have to filter it and make sure it's it's maximizing student learning. And for those of you who are administrators, <coughs> And for those of you who are not, I think you have to be very careful about bringing materials into the classroom that have not had some kind of a general approval by the school or the administration, because sometimes uh, curricular materials or what you think is really helpful could be something that's very objectionable. I think of uh, country expectations. I think of uh, social expectations that might be different in one country to another. So I say, be very careful. Make sure that you have a process for bringing in materials other than the standardized textbook, which you use as your main resource. So our curriculum standards that we have as an accrediting body that we judge when we come in um, are outlined here in these, uh, what are they, five different indicators, six different indicators, where the standards are aligned with the mission of the school. The content standards are measurable and aligned with national or international expectations. Again, we're going to be talking about the common core, but you could have other types of standards. When we go in and accredit a school, it doesn't matter what type of standards that they utilize. We are evaluating the school and we can come in and actually look at any type of school from a Canadian school to a French school to an Arabic school um, because good education and good curriculum content is good education and curriculum content. So that's what we like to focus on. Um, content standards, they have to define what students need to know at each grade level. It needs to be clear and it needs to be uh, communicated and utilized when selecting instructional materials. And then also, we're going to be talking about integration. Integration is so, it's, it's important, and I think it's underutilized in education. Uh, Dr. Ray already talked about instruct, instructional materials, making sure that they're aligned with educational goals. And then last, students are held to high academic standards, that we're utilizing higher order thinking strategies to engage students and to help them reach their potentials. And when we're talking about helping each student reach their potential, we might have some students who struggle to learn the content and we need to give them extra time and extra help and support or extra assignments or, or something else. Or, and then we also have the students that excel and we need to make sure that we're meeting their expectations too and helping them reach their potentials by giving them work that's gonna help them lead along, maybe a project or different activities. Um, instead of just letting them sit there when they when they finish their work because they're so um, like they're they're excelling about the other students. So uh, these are the ones, as Dr. Jake said, when we come into your school, these are some of the standards we look at, and these are the ones specifically uh, regarding a curriculum. But uh, let's talk just a, a little bit further than the curriculum itself, which we're going to talk about, and that is it refers to the lessons and academic content. Now, what will happen here is, uh, as teachers, you don't develop the curriculum by yourself. This is a school-wide project, which I, I promise you, that's not a quick fix. It's not something you just decide. You decide this as a school because when we talk about scope and sequence, you can't determine that just for your grade level. But academic content is what we might refer to as lesson planning. For instance, if you're given this particular set of curricular expectations or standards, then you, with the approval of your department or your administration or whatever, you then develop your lesson planning. And probably every teacher will have a little bit different way of approaching this, but they all approach the same thing. They're specifically addressing a content. And Dr. Ray, there's a good question in the chat for from Malonga. Um, they write uh, that, that teachers 
um, focus on the curriculum so much that they forget about their students. And Malonga, we just want to say that we're going to be getting to that. That's at the very end because we can't forget the students. I know we touched on that just a little bit as we were talking about the array global standards and indicators, um, but we, we can't forget about the students. We can't forget about helping each and every one of them reach their potential. And, and you know, this is, this is one of the, the basic tenets of Array Global is that the student is the customer and we have to emphasize and we're certainly not trying to indicate here today that the curriculum is the end all of end alls. It is a system that you use. But of course, uh, the, the purpose of this workshop today is not student centered. It is curriculum centered. And of course, we put above that the whole idea of student centered and student expectations. So the definition for curriculum, kind of in a nutshell, is the knowledge and skills students are expected to learn. So we're going to be talking about how to create that and how to make sure that it's being implemented with, with fidelity throughout uh, the school system. And I've, I've got to say, Dr. Mike just put something up that I really think is important in the chat. One of the biggest challenges to aligning curriculum are teachers who don't want to give up something they already are teaching, even though that material is not appropriate. That is, you know, that's why curriculum is a school-wide project. And it's not something that a teacher decides on his or her own. This is a school-wide project. And sometimes teachers are going to have to give up what they want to do. We call this a hobby curriculum. My hobby is to teach this, and I'm going to teach it. It doesn't matter what the curriculum is, because I love to teach this particular subject. It might not have anything to do with what the curriculum is that you're supposed to be teaching. Well, don't you think sometimes too, Dr. Ray, that teachers like to do a unit because they are so passionate about it and they like do they, they like it so much that they think the students are going to like it. So they just keep it in there because they're the ones passionate, but it doesn't necessarily fit into the curriculum all the time. Exactly. And, you know, that, as I said, that's that's a hobby. Uh, my hobby is to teach this particular unit or lesson. Doesn't matter if it doesn't fit. I just love it. The students love it. It might not have anything to do. And if we're if we're wondering why our students don't don't perform well on uh, uh, external assessments, it's probably because we do a lot of hobby teaching that my hobby is to teach this. And so I'm going to teach it doesn't matter if it doesn't go along with uh, with what we uh, what we're supposed to be doing. So we so, need to put our personal preferences aside and just focus on what the students need to know. Right. And again, this is a school-wide project. It's something you don't do by yourself. Yeah. So curriculum typically refers to knowledge and skills that students are expected to learn. You know, I use these, these four words. Students will know, be, show, or do. Those, those are the things that, that, that students will be able to demonstrate. They will either demonstrate they know it, or they will understand that they can be this. Uh, we're talking about multiculturalism. We're talking about acceptance of others. We're talking about things here like uh, uh, online or uh, education that is not in the classroom. Show, they'll be able to demonstrate this. Obviously, sometimes it's by by a written exam, sometimes it's by many other ways of assessment, or do, they will do this because they know it. So that's where, uh, that's where teachers or students will show that they have grasped it, they got it, and they're going to be able to do one of those four things. Uh, there's a, a question, Dr. Ray, in the chat that might be good to talk about. Um, Samer writes that it's uh, that it's important for some educational systems we have in the world, like the International Baccalaureate, the IB program, that they don't suggest a, a, a specific curriculum. Um, and it's all about engaging students into doing things practically. And I would, I mean, uh, let me, I can answer that briefly here too, Samer, is that the IB is a very structured type curriculum. Um, it's, it's very, very structured. prescribed on what you do from from week to week, month to month, and everyone needs to be on the same page with day, that. Day to day, almost yeah. hour by hour. And so they, the IB curriculum, it does follow all these same um, items that we're talking about. Some people like it because it's very prescribed. It's very strict and schools have to follow that. And, and um, departments across the department, you're going to be on the same page every single day. Whereas some schools, some countries uh, are okay with having a little bit more flexibility. So something uh, interesting to talk about, if you have further questions about that, we can address that at the end of the day. But that's that's a good question as we get into this because of 
the structure and uh, that some curriculum is, is forced upon us. So then we're going to talk about uh, uh, just one slide back, Dr. Jake, if okay. we go back into. Uh, so now we're into the individual teachers. Now remember, the individual teacher is part of the whole. It's not the individual teacher unto himself or herself. But now the individual teacher on the basis of this curriculum is going to have specific learning standards, is going to develop lessons, which uh, we're going to show you a video in just a little bit about how you can work on these lessons together, the assignments and the materials. This is the responsibility of the teacher use, the teacher uses to help develop this curriculum. And then the elements of the curriculum that we that we often talk about is the scope, the sequence, integration, and continuity. And Dr. Ray, you do such a good job uh, describing what scope and sequence are. I'm going to leave that up to you. Okay, so uh, scope is best defined as the breadth and content to be covered in a curriculum at any time. I, I'll give you an example of scope. Okay, uh, when I began this whole business uh, in education after I was graduated from uh, university and I thought, hey, listen, I've got this nailed down. I know what to do and how to do it. So uh, I understood that uh, I taught English as a subject and I understood that by the end of grade 12, students were expected to develop and write a paragraph that had an appropriate topic sentence, that had uh, appropriate outline of what was going to be handled in there, that the words were spelled correctly, that the grammar was correct, the punctuation was correct, and that this all led to the rest of the essay. Okay, that was, that was an expectation for the end of grade 12. Now, obviously, and some of you heard me, have heard me say this, we don't expect that in grade one. Now, the grade one teacher should know what's happening by the end of grade 12, at least somewhat. But the grade one teacher, maybe the grade one teacher, her or his part of the curriculum is to just learn, uh, help students how to learn to spell boy, girl, uh, ball, uh, play. And, and maybe that's the part that you can handle at grade one. And then if you put the next step, say grade two, then you, you go beyond maybe these basic spelling words. And I, I'm not saying this is what it should be, but I'm saying you go beyond these basic spelling words and say, how do you put these words to, go, to, to use? Boy plays with ball. Now we're putting together and we're getting a little bit further. And so that's the sequence. The scope is how you, uh, you go for uh, what you know at the end. Now, this gets especially important when you're talking about individualizing curriculum, because if you have a student in grade three or grade four or whatever, and you have an expectation that students are to be at a certain level at that grade level, you're not, if you have 25 students, you're going to have 25 di different uh, degrees of understanding of that grade level. Some are going to be below what you expect at that grade level. Some will be at what you expect, and some will be above what you expect. And if you know what should have happened last year, you could help those students who aren't, aren't up to your grade level yet. And if you know what is supposed to happen next year, you can challenge those students who are at or above grade level to do that. That's why scope and sequence are important. I said earlier, and I, and I truly, truly mean this, if you don't hear anything else today, understand the whole concept of scope and sequence. And it's not something you can do by yourself, but you are individually responsible for those 25 students you have at this grade level to make sure that you understand what happened before, what's happening now, and what's going to happen next year. All right. So the next important part is the sequence. And this is the order in which you're teaching content. Um, so it could be the what, what you're teaching at the very beginning of the, the year, all the way through, and from month to month, all the way until the end of the year. And so teachers need to kind of keep this uh, uh, idea in mind that, you know, you move from unit to unit to unit. And if you find it by your assessment in, in one way or the other, it doesn't have to be paper and pencil test. If you find in your assessment that students are grasping the con the concept or the learning that you're supposed to have at this particular time, then you can move on to the sequence. But if you find that they don't have it, you better reteach it. 
So it's usually provided in a, in a matrix or a chart. And we're going to give you just a, a, a good example here of a matrix or a chart of sequence and uh, uh, give you kind of an idea uh, of, of where we go. So scope and sequence is usually prescribed in, uh, uh, in, in usually in a chart. And again, it's a school-wide project. School-wide project, it's not something you do by yourself. So it's usually prescribed in a matrix or a chart. And so let's move on and say, okay, so we believe that uh, scope is what students know, be, show, do, which I, uh, which I explained just a little bit ago. And the scope and sequence is simply the what and when of knowledge and understanding. Make sure you get the what settled in your students' minds before you go on to the next sequence. Because many times we just assume everybody gets it. I taught it, you learned it, or you didn't learn it, but we're moving on to the next issue. So understand please that the scope and the sequence are uh, what you do, uh, not only within each grade level, but within each lesson within a grade level. And so uh, if we go to uh, uh, the, the delivery of the content, and I mentioned already the no be show do, and uh, see, that's how that's how we find out if students get it or not. They're they're going to demonstrate it, and and please know. And we're going to you know we're not going to talk much about assessment today, but there are many many ways that you can assess students to find out. It's not just a paper and pencil test. There are many ways that when we do a workshop on assessment, and we've done some already. It's, they're going to have different ways. So what happens at each grade level? So let's do an understanding now uh, of, of a sequence that we're going to show in social studies. Let's just throw this out as an idea. It's not, it's not like the only thing it happens to be uh, uh, in social studies, but let's move on to the next slide and say that the, uh, uh, excuse me, the next one, I think we covered like this. Yeah, I there like we go. This one. Yeah. Okay, so let's just pretend. Let's just pretend it's a social studies course. Here, look, look down at the end here. We know the scope because the scope is going to be what we expect students to know by the end of grade 12. Right now, my bar is in the way. But all of these lead up to grade 12. Maybe in grade one, the sequence is we're going to study all about me. And then grade two, we're going to start about my family. And see, see how this progresses down the, down the sequence here of a, an example of something you do in social studies. And so the, the idea is that by the end of grade 12, students are, are going to be uh, showing the idea of how this whole works into what's going on in our world today. Uh, everything that we've been dealing with these last couple of years because of COVID and school shutdown and distance learning should help us to understand that the current events with all of these things that have happened. We, for instance, Dr. Jake and I were in a country uh, just two or three weeks ago and they didn't have a mask requirement, never did have a mask requirement. They just believed that they took this special lemon drink in the evening and it would keep everybody safe. Well, you know what? Didn't see any more cases of COVID there than we see anywhere else. But that was their country's expectation. We've been in many countries where we have to wear masks everywhere. We still have to wear masks when we're in a medical facility here in the United States. We don't have to wear, wear them much anymore. But anytime we go to the dentist, the doctor, the eye doctor, uh, whatever, we have to wear a mask. And so that's my country. But we learn these things and all of these lead to that total sequence. So Dr. Ray, you're saying what a student has to learn when they graduate is the scope and the steps to get there is the sequence. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we just threw this one up. It might not be the one sure. that you identify with, but but your subject area, uh, Dr. Mike, I think uh, since you're a science teacher, uh, maybe what would that grade one be in science, for instance? Grade one in, in science is just starting to understand the world around us as being science. For example, taking a look at things like dirt and what what makes make makes up dirt. What takes what are what are plants and why do we consider them plants? So you could do very simple things along that kind of line. So, uh, yeah, first 
everything to me, of course, to us science folks, every, life is science. And so everything is science. So it just kind of kind of works together really well. But one of the things that I wanted to say too, is when you determine what they need to know, but at the end, then designing backwards called backwards design, then shows you exactly when you need to put it in and what that'll work out to be. And that's a, that's a tough thing. Everybody wants to go, well, we'll start here and we'll do this and we'll do this. No, you need to start back here where's the where's the end point and then work your way to the front so you know that everything gets covered yeah, and doesn't you, you say plan with the end in mind and we have to yeah. do that with curriculum too yeah and, and i say this and and dr mike you you led me into it and i should have said it earlier think forward design backwards right if you need to know this by the end of grade 12 what do you need to know by the end of grade 11 to get ready for grade 12, 10 for 11, nine for 10. So thank you. I'm sorry, Dr. Jake. I just, no, that's okay. Dr. Ray, what, what do you think about those, those curriculums that are very prescribed, like the Cambridge program, like the IB program, where teachers already have that scope and sequence already planned out for them and in, in some of these different areas? Uh, yes, I, you know, and we do, we do deal with schools where it's very prescribed. We hear this a lot about the, the IB curriculum, about the British curriculum and so forth. As Dr. Jake said earlier, sometimes it's almost by the hour, which we're supposed to be doing that hour. And, and so I say, look very carefully. If you want to be certified by the British curriculum, uh, you've got to do what they say. But teachers should look at this and where you can you need to insert those things which might be because i know on these prescribed curriculums they just assume that everybody will be at the same level at the same time and go on to the next level and and that that just that's just that's not the way education works that's not the way we as former teachers somewhat current teachers at the university level that's not the way it works you don't just assume that everybody has it just because you did it i i taught it if you didn't learn it your problem no it's 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 something that we have to make sure the students are learning. I think we kind of went through that. The next thing we wanted to talk about was integration, which I said at the very beginning is excuse something me, excuse that, me. I, before you ahead. do, there was yeah. one question, and I want to pick it up here because I think it's a good question. The answer is yes to the question. <laughs> Marcella. <laughs> Said, uh, may I may I get this right, please? The scope is how wide and sequence is step by step. And I say, Marcella, you have hit it on the head. That's exactly a good definition of scope and sequence. Scope is how wide, sequence is step by step. Beautiful, beautiful. So we need to give question. her the gold star for today. Yeah, Mar Marcella gets a gold star for today. Ah, oh, okay. Good big smiley face. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to go on to integration? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I had to jump that in while I was there. <laughs> no, that's okay. Because it is it is something that I think we would all like to do. We just don't do it uh, enough or well enough in our um, in our subject areas that we're talking about. When I taught science, it was a little bit easier, like probably Dr. Mike. Science is, is integrated so easily with mathematics, of course. I just always called science and applied math. Um, and then now you see a lot more integration of writing in curriculum because students need to learn how to write a lot better. If they know how to write, they're going to be able to read and be able to tackle things a lot easier. So we want to talk about integration. I'll say it again. I've said it three times already. And let me say again, you're not alone in the development of the curriculum. And the more you learn to, and back to the other question, I think Mike, uh, Dr. Mike put this statement on there about some teachers, this is the way I've always done it, I'm not going to change. If we start working together, there's a better chance that that teacher is going to see, oh, I'm part of a whole here. I'm not unto myself. This is part of the whole school or the whole institution. So we're so, advising, and I think Dr. Ray, you're getting to this, about not just talking to people in your subject area, in your departments, but reaching out to other departments and working together collaboratively on different projects, different assignments, different programs. And one example that we have is, it, let's say you're a social studies teacher and you wanna take your students to the mu museum, you could have them come back and write, do a writing, um, prompt about what did you learn that you didn't before. You're integrating uh, writing into your social studies curriculum. Yes. 
So, and then, um, yeah, here's another math one. I thought that was, it was a good yeah. one that we came up with. If And it could talk about how the distance is from the school to the museum, figuring out how long it's going to take there, how many miles, how many kilometers away it is, something like that. Good ideas on integration. Yeah. And I think we have a video coming up soon. Yeah, we yeah we had one, uh, uh, how to integrate PE and language arts, write an essay about how exercise improve your well-being. And I mean, that you could come up with these different ideas, but you have to sit down in, in groups. You have to sit down in your departments, in your staff, and talk about ways that you can integrate. Because again, you're trying to maximize your time. So if students can be learning about science and social studies in their language arts class by reading some specific novel or short story, you are, you're, you're maximizing your time um, and, in, in and, student learning. And when I was a principal, I, I had the head of the English department and the head of the social studies department come to me. Uh, the junior year at that time required was US history and the English requirement was American literature. Oh, we're talking about America in both cases. So they came and asked if they could team teach history and American literature at the same time. Wow, how, how important this was. And they actually were able to integrate the historical issues and the writing of the time. And that was an integration that the students greatly benefited from. And they got the concept because it wasn't an individual little, oh, here's the history, don't worry about the English. Or here's the, here's the English or the American, his, American literature, don't worry about the history. They work together. And do you feel like Dr. Ray or, or Dr. Mike that students are more engaged when you integrate subject matter? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, a really good example of when I taught physical science, we had I had them do a research project on um, alternative energy sources, and it was a it was a paper. I was I mean there was it was writing. I mean there was just like out of an English uh, report that they had to write, and having the English teacher grade the grammar and the structure along those kinds of lines, and I graded the content in terms of the science content. It allowed the students to see how English was needed for science and how science could be utilized in English. And that way they wrote one paper that satisfied both classes. Excellent. Yeah, it's a great example. And, and yeah, you probably saw the students were much more engaged and, and really enjoying that activity. So continuity is when we relate how previous learning and future learning relate in terms of cumulative effects of learning. So we're, we're, we, can, we can try to figure out ways that uh, we can integrate some subject matter from a previous year or a previous unit and, and help them in understanding that content a little bit better. And I'll get into trouble here because I'm not a science teacher, but for you science teachers, remember that last year we learned this in science. Now we're going to apply that to what we're doing this year. So, and I noticed I didn't give a subject. I just, I gave a concept, but, you, but that's what Dr. Mike was just saying. It is a matter of identifying what was and how it relates to what is. And here's an example of, of in science. In unit one, you would identify animals. And this is probably for, you know, a kindergarten class. Unit two, identify similarities among the animals and then define maybe what a mammal is and then apply that information when you go to unit four, when you visit a zoo. So we get into standards and benchmarks, and just once again, a definition here, a standard or benchmark, it defines what students should know, be, show, do at each grade level or at each benchmark level. I've been in some schools uh, where they do benchmarks uh, not at every grade level, but grade three, grade six, grade nine, grade 12, something like that. And so the, 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 for instance, the benchmark is a grade three these grades one through three teachers work together to make sure that the benchmark or, or the standard at the end of grade three is met. Uh, we talked a little bit about integration and we want to show a short video. So hold on just a second. And this is a video about how staff members get together collaboratively and um, decide on how to integrate some subject areas. So here we go. A uh, couple of brief things. We have the agenda over there. Some things we wanted to bring up. And we only got half an hour, so we'll 
do our best to use our time efficiently. When teachers talk to each other, teachers learn from each other. There's so many great ideas that our teachers come up with that engage kids, get kids to think outside of the box, that I'm just amazed at what we can accomplish when we work together. Individuals create great ideas, but really to move schools forward, I believe that everyone needs to be together and in dialoguing with each other and creating a, a conversation about how to best serve uh, students. I feel really fortunate that at our school we have grade level prep, which means that every day all the sixth grade teachers are able to discuss various topics, whether that be student concerns we have or how to better integrate curriculum. Here is what is remains of the weather balloon. We're really excited. This is actually yeah, pretty much everything, minus the balloon oh, itself. So Last year, uh, an engineering teacher and myself thought it'd be really great to have a sort of science engineering crossover project where we launched a high altitude weather balloon way up into the stratosphere with the intention of getting some unique data uh, to help reinforce sixth grade topics of watershed studies and whatnot. tree it landed on somewhere on the click attack. Yeah. It went somewhere in between. Right? And that's what we're going to try to show to everyone using this data that everyone's pawing through right now. I definitely had a pretty clear idea in mind of what I wanted to do upon retrieving our weather balloon. And it was great to bring the topic to the rest of the team to find out how we could connect it to language arts and other content areas. Yesterday, uh, we were able to make a crossover connection to math. I was having students actually looking through the data. And I was trying to rack my brain about how we might make more of a robust like language arts connection. That's not my strength. I was wondering if you guys had any I ideas. Also really cool imagination piece with the travel of that too. I agree. Look at the pictures, trace the But I think it's a great way to bring in the scientific writing too. I mean, you could do both. You could take both. You could do the same type of writing for both of them. One would be scientific writing and one would be creative writing. And basically we're inspired by one single experience and how could you look at it from different perspectives. That'd be cool. You have to provide the structure for collaboration. That's essential. You can't can't have collaboration if teachers don't have time to collaborate. And so by tweaking a master schedule, you can provide opportunities for collaboration. That collaboration leads to great things. Because of that common prep time, it allows every team to plan field trips that allow them to figure out how do we relate the curriculum within the different subject areas. So you remember we went on the field trip, that was gathering data for helping the kids understand science based on where we live and our unique geology in the gorge. When the science teachers decided to do this geology unit on land formations, we saw the opportunity as language arts teachers to bring the idea of the legends that explain these into reading and language arts so they could write a legend and then perform it. And they could choose to work alone or in partners or in a group and they've done skits and story books and comic strips and puppet shows and awesome. iMovies, so yeah, they're, they're... Are those recorded somewhere that we could watch or are they, were they... We took a trip and it was meant to be for science and then in this class we're writing like legends about Beacon Rock and Watchella Falls and like how Hood River Gorge came to be. The effect for the kids is they hear common messages rather than it being discrete classrooms and subjects yeah. and teachers yeah. and classes. Um, they see it all relating together. It is incredibly important to allow teachers to collaborate and work together, not only to enrich the learning of all their students, but ourselves as professionals. And may I point out that uh, I'm proud of this video because it's from the state of Oregon. That's where I was born. That's where I spent most of my professional life until four years ago. But this is uh, this is the state I grew up in, and I've actually been in that school. And uh, and I can tell you, I don't know if you saw that last uh, part of their slide that said their scores were higher, higher than most of the scores in the state because, and I I think it's because of this collaboration. You know, if you understand a concept. So we, we look into now Common Core and we're gonna run along here because 
Uh, Dr. Jake, I think we're going to run out of time here. Yeah, that's okay. Though. Go, I mean, go ahead with Common Core. They'll still have copies of our... our uh, yes, and please, PowerPoint. I would recommend all of you, if you would, we've gone through a lot of material really fast. I would recommend all of you to get a copy of this uh, presentation and maybe use it in your school or, or your, for, for your own use, because hopefully there have been some really, really important concepts here about curriculum. And I think it would be good to preface this part of the presentation about the Common Core that Dr. Ray and I and, and Dr. Mike are not promoting the Common Core. It's a it's a common um, uh, curriculum that's out there, and so we're ju we're just talking about it to answer some of the questions that are out there. Um, and if and if you are using the IB program or a British program, there might be some items in here that you might find interesting just about curriculum in general. And just as much as I don't like going into a school where they say, well, we use the, and they name a textbook couple, publisher, I don't like going into a school and saying, all our curriculum is common core. What? You see, I, I think that we've studied common core enough to, to say this. Common core is largely a process. It's not necessarily a product. And we're going to show you this in just a minute here, but it, it has some very, very, very good points. I'm not degrading that, but don't think that Common Core is the end all of end alls because it's not. You've got to have a basic curriculum that says exactly what students are to know, be, show, do. And Common Core is really more of a process, which we'll get into here. And so the big part about the Common Core is it helps students master increasingly difficult problems in text. Um, and so we it focuses more on the process than it does on the product. And so we had a short video. It's kind of a it's kind of a fun, fun little video. Um, and we won't show the whole thing, but just just a, a few moments of it. So the one on the left is uh, non common core and the one on the right is common core. To its 10. And they're racing. I've got three tens, which is 30 and five ones, so that is 30 plus five. Oh, I'm sorry, five. common core is on the left and non-common core on the right. 12 is one ten plus two ones. Okay, so that's step one. The next step would be to draw a large box. So product is, they're already finished on the right-hand side. Now he's going to make some coffee okay. because he finished and it a long time box, ago. Common core, the process, so the is top, showing how long it takes to go through step by step. Plus five, and on the side, I'm going to put 10 plus two. And so we'll give you a chance to go through and uh, and watch that on your own um, because it is it is kind of comical um, to see how how long that process is. So you, you, be careful with Common Core, as I guess is what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, but the, I, there's a lot of good things about it. It will increase students' proficiency levels. It can, uh, if it's done uh, correctly and in the appropriate way, by focusing on core skills uh, while maintaining that flexibility. That example, she wasn't maintaining that flexibility. She was going through and doing way too many steps while the person on the right was able to go and make coffee and probably sit down and read read a, a magazine for a while while the other one was still going on. It just took too long, but that's not how all Common Core is. Um, some people take it to the extreme. So again, Common Core is a process. You do get to some standards, but sometimes the way to get there is very complicated. And uh, in fact, we've seen in very extreme situations where student might come up with the right answer, but if the student didn't go in the process that Common Core said you should go through, it's marked wrong because it didn't go through. And you, you saw the example of, of the math problem. So one thing that I see in, in, in some math classes about the process that I really like in my elementary school is they'll do math talks. The, the students will be given a problem. Um, the students have a few minutes to, to complete that problem. And then they have some time to sit down and talk about the ways that each student completed that problem. Because we all know, we've all done enough math that there are several different ways 
usually a couple of different ways to answer uh, different math problems. They all come to the same result, but what is the process? And so talking about that process and helping students see that those different processes that are out there just helps them understand that mathematical concept a little bit more. Um, but we have to sometimes just get down to it, sometimes with math specifically, because that's where Common Core seems to really get uh, some negative publicity. Sometimes we just have to memorize, but the students first have to understand, for example, the times table why they are what they are, why three times three is nine. But eventually uh, for students, they just have to get into it, memorize it. So they're not saying, oh, three times three times three, that's nine. Um, they need to really get in and just understand it. But if they understand that process, it helps them uh, with further math concepts. And so remember the elements of curriculum that we've talked about, scope, sequence, integration, and continuity. They should all be working together to provide a, a quality curriculum experience for students. And so to summarize, remember at the very early part, we put the same list up, scope, sequence, integration, continuity. We said, this is what we're gonna talk about today. Now we're summarizing, we're saying, here's what we've talked about. Now I fully expect that of the several hundred people we have watching us today being part of this, you're all going to receive this and understand this at different levels. That's why I encourage you to download this presentation and uh, to go over it. And Dr. Jake, Dr. Mike, and I are always open to questions if you want to email or write to any of us, but that's really, uh, that's really uh, the essence. But then the next point is extremely important and it will say uh, internet has brought some many shortcuts but it's dangerous to find a site with sample lessons because they may not match the scope. If you, if you try to adopt the curriculum of one of the states in the United States, don't just say, this is our curriculum. It's good, most of them are very good, but you have to individualize that to your school, your community, your country, your specific students. One of the then, questions came oh, up ahead, a second ago uh, from Raza but about utilizing culture and utilizing and, and recognizing the culture is what will bring about meaning to the lessons. For example, I taught at the very beginning of my career in a, in a more of a uh, an urban setting. And so the examples that I used in my, in my science classes dealt with urban kinds of situations. The last part of my career, I, I was at a very, or at least my, my uh, K-12 career, I was at a, a rural school and so the examples needed to be based around the rural society, not around the urban society, because otherwise the students had no context. Context becomes exceedingly important for the learning. And one thing that we talked about at the very beginning a little bit, and someone even put it, something in the chat about the importance of students. Yeah, Sometimes, and, go ahead. Well, you know, we've said it before and we'll say it again here. Sometimes the most important thing that students need in their lesson today does not involve the curriculum. We have to, somebody put a comment earlier on about dealing with very uh, am, uh, ambitious students who spend a lot of time and a lot of troubles. What we need to do is find out what the right now is before we can go on to the curriculum. So that's, as, as educators, that's where we have to be very, very careful to understand. We need to understand where students are today. If we really understand that and they know we understand it, I go back to something we've said in other work, workshops, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've got to show your students that you care for where they are right at this moment. We were, as I, as Dr. Jake and I said, we were in a Turkey a couple, two or three weeks ago, and in the middle of the night, one night, there was an earthquake. It wasn't a big earthquake, but if we yeah, ignore it, it was like one point six. It was, it was pretty. I mean, it woke me up. <laughs> <laughs> Mike shaking his head too. Uh, uh, no, no, no. But anyway, but, bit, but yeah. if a school didn't recognize the next day that students that we had an earthquake last night. Uh, let's let's talk about this. We can relate because it's on the students' minds. So that's good. So we want to uh, conclude today. I'd like to conclude with uh, something that I, I uh, used a long, long time ago. 
And uh, I, I use this as our challenge for today in, uh, in summary. Uh, and it's about Socrates. Most of you have heard of Socrates and uh, the great, we know him as uh, the great educator. In fact, some of you are aware of the fact that uh, one of, a teaching method that we use is called the Socratic method. But it's, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still interesting that he denied that he could teach anybody anything. He said, I can only make a person think. I can only make a person think. He never wrote a word, but his greatest gift to civilization was he explained how we have to make students or people think. And if we can do that, if we can accomplish that, we've encapsulated everything that we've talked about today, everything that every workshop has been on. If we can just use the Socratic method and say, we need to help students think. As I said, it's very interesting. Socrates never wrote a word. Look it up. He never wrote a word. He just taught people the importance of how they think. Well, thank you, Dr. Ray. I especially appreciate the, the words of wisdom at the end of the workshops. And I know many of us do look forward to it who've been attending for so long. Um, we're going to stay online for a little bit longer. And I've posted the the post-workshop survey, please make sure that you fill that out. That's the only way that we can determine if you've attended and that we can process your certificate and certificates will be handed out a little bit later on. Um, we have several people on Facebook too. The, the form has also been posted there. So please get on and start filling that out. And while you're filling that out, we're gonna open it up to questions because we like doing that. Um, so please, if you'd like to uh, raise your hand or post something in the in the chat and we will uh we'll answer that so it looks like Feruz of course we got to have you you're like the, the shining star for 2022 we appreciate you man uh, I told Feruz early on if he weren't here I wouldn't know how to act <laughs> oh by oh, the way by the way I feel Dr. Jake, by the way excuse me Feruz just one second yes. uh, Dr. Jake uh uh somebody asked for the emails of the three of us yeah, and um, there's an email in the chat that I put, um, info at arrayglobal.org. You send that to us and we'll get it right away. Okay. Yep. Bruce. Yeah, uh, I should first uh, commend you for your collaborative efforts in, in bringing us uh, the full picture of curriculum development, which is quite insightful. And, and to be honest, you provided us with a bird eye view, you know, uh, pictures and images of what a curriculum development may look like in reality. Like I, I gain lots of uh, insights, and I have I have to be honest and, and thankful for all that, all all the all the, all that your efforts. And my question is, you know, uh, as we know, there are basically three types of uh, curriculum development: um, subject centered, uh, learner centered, and problem centered designs. So uh, going back to that earlier point about integration, so I wonder uh, which design the school may go for, or do they go for a kind of an in integrated design uh, for opting to, to, to suit to the school demands? Like basically across the globe, which design do the schools align their uh, education most with I I either the learner centered or teachers uh, the learner centered uh, the subject centered or the problem centered or all together so could you please shed some light on that thank you uh dr mike dr poe what do you think uh, i i'm sorry i was actually looking at some some of the chat things so i didn't yeah. hear the yeah. entire and, and, and i'm sorry i was i was busy i was busy for who's typing our email addresses in <laughs> and I, th uh, I think the big thing for us with it is that it 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 shouldn't be teacher centered everything should be student centered but there are times that um things are focused and or or told by us by by school or government that we have to follow and we just have to uh, obliged by those things. Um, here in the United States, every state has different standards and uh, that we have to be following for, for that curriculum. And you just have to work with those different things. But if we focus and ensure that thing that our curriculum is student focused, we're never gonna we're never gonna falter. Yeah, and, and if I the sense of your question too, Farouz, was 
how you choose as a school. I think that you have to really work as a team to do this. It could be a particular pattern that you want to adopt, or it could be a combination of several things. But you're responsible for your students, and you know your students better than any of us. We come in for an accreditation visit. We don't know your students like you do. So it really is an individual school decision. But I do, if you know, other than the fact of understanding scope and, scope and sequence, if you do understand, you have to work together as a team just as that Hood River Middle School did. Uh, Saza, I see Saza has a question. Yeah, Saza, you can unmute yourself now. Hello, good night, everyone. It's night here, I don't know there. It's, oh, it's, my it's country. very cold, it's, it's, Saza, very yeah, cold. Yeah, we're, we're almost zero degrees here yeah. in Colorado, and it's noon. Uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit, grade. so that's like negative. Oh, hello, everyone, yeah, this cold. is Saza from Kurdistan Erbil. Uh, thank you so much for this workshop. It's a very interesting um, uh, topic. Uh, just my question is, uh, you mentioned that we, are, we need to use the textbooks as a resource. And that's what usually our coordinator tell us. But my question is that, should we uh, follow all the pages uh, from the textbook, page by page, or sometimes we can skip because we are facing a problem in this uh, case. Our books, some of them are more than our students' ability. So we find it as a challenge, even if we get it, uh, give it to the student when we use differentiation in the classroom, but still we find it as a challenge. So what do you suggest to skip this way? Because we are in IB school, and we are dep depending on break sheets as well, many different resources. So in this case, we're, we find it, uh, we don't want to skip any page and we want to do it and the students find difficulty. So I don't know what do you suggest in this case? I love the Thank question. So Saz. I love the question. And I just want to say, no, 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 no. Don't feel you have to cover every page. Find those pages that are resources for your adopted curriculum. And if you find that there is something that might be a resource, but it's not of an understandable way for students, find something that explains the same thing in better language or you interpret for them. But I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make as teachers is on day one, you cover page one, and on day 180, you, you cover page 180. That's not a curriculum. So oh. please, Saza, please, yeah. uh, you find those things which are helpful for you. You've got your stated curriculum, if you do it like we just did, like we mm -hmm. just talked about, but you find those things. And you know, uh, if any of you saw the video last month with uh, the, the presenter who said, you know, she felt yeah. she taught a, taught a lesson all wrong, and she had to go back and apologize the next day to students. Well, sometimes <laughs> you have to say, hey, I apologize because yeah. page 37 <laughs> of this textbook doesn't really explain it the way I think you need to learn it. So let me, you know, that's a great resource that you could use. So I'm sorry, Dr. Jake and Dr. Yeah. Mike, I had to jump in on that one. No, I, well, think, you, I think you hit it. Well, and another Thank piece. That, of the exactly, ringer, that was the answer I wa I was waiting for. And uh, I'm sorry. Uh, another thing, another challenge that we're facing as a teacher is the parents that they want they don't want to see any uh, page that is skipped from the book. So they directly come. Why are you skipping pages and these things? So it's hard for us to make them understand. We usually tell them during parent teacher conference that. Uh, for example, the idea or the subject on that page, we explain to the student, but instead of that page that we find it a challenge for the student, we use a worksheet that was just suitable for their level. Yeah. But well, it's a bit hard to create, make them understand Creative, creative this. ways, Saza, to do the same thing. Just right. find creative. And the, the bell ringer actually gives you a great opportunity to find out what the students already know about a particular topic. So if you ask them a question about what you're going to teach that day, and and or several you know tell them you know have them tell you what yeah, you prayer knowledge to the, yeah but they already have the prior knowledge you can skip through that and say okay you all, you all seem to know this so we're going to move forward and actually be able to, to cover more materials so the bell ringer can be a very important piece to use in your classes let's go to, yeah, that's uh, what, what usually we depend on prayer knowledge that's yes. how we start using every topic to know right. uh, to know about the students prayer knowledge Good. Let's go to, I hope I say this correctly, Molefe. Uh, Molefe, you can unmute yourself. Un unmute yourself, please. Maybe there we go. Well, we can see you, but we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. There you go. 
the left A, we're waiting for you. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for the information. I would like to have more info on integration. I think I've missed that part. Thank you. Well, you can always go back and, and watch our videos. They are on our YouTube channel. The, I posted the link um, along with the, the workshop survey. You can get in there and rewatch things if you missed any of it or, or show it to the rest of your faculty if you want to. Integration is so important and we provided a lot of good information and a, I think a pretty good um, uh, kind of overview of, of all um, uh, and I think we even had a video about integration. So yes. I encourage you to get in and, and see how you can best integrate the different subject areas in your class and your in your school. Thank uh, you very to I hope I'm saying that correctly. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Hello. Hello. Yes. Good evening. Hello. 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 We're waiting for your question. What do you got? Um, my name is Naitu from Tanzania. And uh, I have two questions. First of all, I have to congratulate you for a good presentation and uh, it has helped us a lot. Thank you. My question is, yes, my question is how does the uh, education policy of the helps in curriculum development? That's the first question. The second question is, sometimes politicians affect or they have their own interest and sometimes they affect the development of the curriculum in, a, in, a, in education. How can we eradicate this so that we can have the, 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 the best curriculum which can help the students to have, uh, to have knowledge and uh, they can help the country. Thank you. Well, yeah. well, let me, you I'm go sorry, <laughs> go to the second part first. Yeah, yeah. Now you two, if you find a way to make the government or the politicians understand what you need to do school and not try to interfere in what you're doing, good luck, tell us all, because we need that here also. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, anyway, that's just my first response. Go ahead, Dr. Jacobs. No, I was going to say the same thing. It's, it, I think the best thing that you can do to get uh, politicians involved is invite them to your school and educate them. Most of them aren't educators. Get them involved and help them try to understand what, what struggles you're dealing with, what you're trying to educate your students for. And they're going to have a different vision and you're going to have to work with them. And you'll probably have to put on your politician hat a little bit to be able to work with them and get them to see your side and you come to a common ground. But uh, us educators, we're not great as politicians, but you can you can do the best that you can. So yeah, I, 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 uh, well, I am excited to hear how that goes for you too. And now to the first part of your question, the first question, I, I overlooked that one. Do you wanna try that one again? You um, said you had... I think he's off right now. So we have a question from en Enrique. I'm, he says in the chat, I'm working on integrating ESL and math and sometimes language, math, computer. Could I have any suggestions for doing or improving to do so uh, to integrate those different subject areas? Any, any ideas, Dr. Mike? Well, in, in terms of, of working through those things, again, you're back to utilizing some of their experiences or how you can tie their prior knowledge to what you're, you're working on. Uh, and this can definitely be, be difficult as you're trying to teach a second language, trying to tie those things together. But the culture piece becomes very, very important so that they understand that this is what they're used to and, and this is the new name or this is the new process to utilize. Math actually works pretty well across the board uh, because it's fairly universal, whereas the other languages are more difficult. Well, Dr. Ray, I think that those are all the questions. Those are all the questions. What uh, Teresa wrote, she said, thanks a million to our awesome facilitators. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Can't wait to see you in January. I think she took our, the words right of our, out of our mouths. Yeah. January workshop, Dr. Jake. Yeah, January workshop is going to be by two awesome educators. It's going to be on January uh, 21st. Again, the third Saturday of every month, it's going to be doctor, uh, two doctors, they both have the last name, uh, Dr. Keller, 
Um, and we're excited to have them on um, to talk about lesson planning and how to create a, an effective lesson plan. So join us at that time, get on our website, sign up if you haven't signed up already, and we will see everyone in January. And they have the same last name because they're married to each other. Yes, we should sorry. say that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.